Hello, if you're joining, uh, my name is Logan. We're gonna be doing a free prep hour tonight uh, for Manhattan Prep for the GRE. Uh, I'm excited to uh, talk with you all about tonight's topic, which is gonna be uh, reading comprehension and specifically uh, passage archetypes. Uh, so I'm gonna talk in a minute about what that means. What is a passage archetype? What are some of them? Uh, what can we do with the knowledge that there actually are some common patterns in the reading comprehension passages that we're gonna see? Um, but if this is your first time coming to a free prep hour, first off, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, if you're here, you can talk to me through the chat uh, feature. Um, no mic uh, or camera in uh, in these sessions, but you can talk to me through there if you have any questions. And as we get towards the end of the night, uh, I'm going to ask you all some questions about a couple passages uh, that I'm going to put up on the screen. Um, so my name's Logan, uh, just to start things off. And for the basic sort of me facts, first off, hello. I hope you all are having a fantastic Sunday night. Uh, I live in Queens, New York. It was absolutely a beautiful day outside today. If it was that where you are today, I hope you got to take advantage. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm in Queens, New York. I've been teaching the GRE uh, for MPREP since uh, 2018. Um, and I only give that backstory to say that I actually came to Manhattan Prep first um, as a video editor, not as a teacher. And I had to level up my, my verbal side a little bit before I uh, became a GRE teacher. And um, when I did that, uh, a couple things really, really helped me. One was, which we're not going to do a lot of tonight, it was analyzing my answer choices, analyzing what, when had I gone right and wrong in picking my answers. Um, but the second, which is what we're going to do tonight, is basically just getting more familiar with what does the GRE do? What are the patterns in what they like to ask me, what they like to show me, um, and what they're really looking for in each type of question. Because um, if you're a good reader, then you're you're ready for these passages, you're ready for these questions, but there might be some calibration about like, okay, what exactly are they gonna show me? And, and what exactly uh, can I expect to have to give them back uh, for each passage? So uh, enough about me, let's talk about the topic, which is passage uh, archetypes. So. When I say a passage archetype, what I basically mean is uh, a common structure of, uh, of GRE verbal passages. Some basic background information. Um, when you are on a GRE um, verbal passage, there are going to be shorter ones like one paragraph. Most of them are going to be like two. And then every once in a while, you'll see a super long one that's like four paragraphs or so. Uh, there's also two types, uh, logic-based and content-based. Um, the content-based ones sound a little bit more like textbooks, um, whereas the logic-based ones, they are a little shorter, a little bit more real world, and they're a little bit more about logical answers rather than what, what's proven in the passage. So one thing clear up front, we're talking about uh, the content-based ones tonight. There are archetypes for logic-based ones as well, um, but really uh, what we're talking about here tonight is um, common patterns in the verbal passages that are content types. So. A passage archetype, you could also call it like a story archetype. Um, and I want you to think of like a TV or movie genre where you sort of know what to expect. When you show up, you turn on your Netflix or your Hulu or you go into the movie theater, you kind of know what to expect with this experience. Uh, can anybody tell me in the chat like an example of that? What pops to mind? A genre where you know what to expect. Maybe not every detail, maybe not like every character arc or name but like some specific things okay a couple people said horror um yeah you at least know elements of what to expect i got a rom-com in there let me clarify that you at least know elements of what to expect so for those of you who said horror um, yeah, you're going to have something that's going to make you jump. You're probably going to have like a creepy character who you don't know at first, like if they're the villain or not. Um, you're going to have someone, you know, in a lot of horror movies, someone will die early and the other characters, you know, will escape and think they're okay for now, but then the big monster will come get them eventually. Rom-com, you know, you've got your moment where everything's perfect, your moment where you think they're going to break up, you've got your meet cute, you've got all these different elements that you're just likely to have 
even though not every single version is going to have all of them. Uh, and that's basically what we're talking about. Um, you know, here's here's the examples that first came to my mind, um, especially like reality shows are very archetypal or or kind of scripted in terms of like the beats that they hit in their stories like and they use these elements like uh, in a in a reality show or a competition show, you know, like the moment when the music gets serious. And like, you're not exactly sure what happened yet, but like, you know, something is going bad for the contestant. And like, you know, it's about to be a commercial break where like the person is like, these cupcakes will never work or something like that. Um, that's like an element of the archetype. You know, and you could think of those for, for any of these other ones that I put up there, like a Western, you know, you've got your classic mu music that shows up when there's about to be like two cowboys having a showdown, you know. Um, so all those elements in a story archetype, uh, they're there for a reason, or they're there for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is they help you know what to expect. Uh, and they actually make following the story structure easier um, so that you can pay more attention to what's specific to the specific story that you're watching. So, you know, in a rom-com, it's actually easier to get to know the characters um, in, in some ways because the plot arc might be a little bit more predictable. It kind of frees up your mind um, to, to watch, uh, you know, something where you sort of know what to expect that's gonna come out in the end. Um, and think about how a, a lot of these things, especially like the competition shows that I mentioned, a lot of people love them because they like to put them on and kind of put their mind at ease. Um, they don't necessarily require 100% attention all of the time when you're um, watching one of these archetypal stories. Uh, and the, the lesson that we're going to look at tonight is, can we bring any part of that into the GRE? Can we bring anything, uh, you know, about the sort of ease of watching or ease of, um, you know, story input into the GRE passages so that they get a little bit more comfortable uh, and, and even, I almost said even fun, but really what I'm trying to say is like, basically the same thing happens. It frees up your brain to focus on the important stuff. Because GRE reading comprehension also has archetypal elements. Um, there's a couple caveats on that that I'm gonna say in a moment before we get all the way into this, but there are parts of um, reading passages. There are certain structures, themes, patterns that show up a lot. Uh, and I think that it is beneficial for you as a test taker to know a little bit about what those are so that you can kind of be an expert, you know, be a field expert when you see them show up. There's a flip side of this, by the way, which is um, being familiar with the questions. That's not what we're going to talk about um, tonight. Actually, tonight, we're not going to focus on questions much at all. Um, we're just going to focus on passages. Uh, there are a lot of videos in the Jerry Prep Hour series on YouTube, um, and a lot of them are on verbal, and a lot of those do talk about like question types. What are the different things they're going to ask you? Um, but uh, there's actually a little bit less talk in our Manhattan Prep materials about uh, the story types, the passage types, what are they going to show you uh, in the first place? So uh, what are some examples of the GRE archetypes? Actually, I'm curious to hear, anybody have any suspicions? Like what would be a GRE version of this? What would be a GRE story archetype or passage archetype in the chat? Theory versus facts or theory and facts. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know if this is exactly what you meant, uh, aid or, or ade, um, but yeah, a lot of um, passages are pretty much just explaining a theory or explaining um, a phenomenon. That's one of the ones that we're gonna get into. Um, so let's start getting into those. Uh, here's a list that I made, but really I wanna show them one by one. So, oh no, secretly don't look, don't read them all. Okay, let's go one by one. Uh, and this first one is basically what uh, I got in the chat there theory uh, and facts, or a theory with facts backing it up. Um, so uh, a lot of passages are just, hey, here's a topic that you've probably never heard of, and we're going to explain it to you. Uh, especially science ones are often like this, but really any topic. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see what's next. A critic's opinion of a work. Uh, if you have gotten much into your GRE studying, you know this is a big one. Um, basically, they're always talking about critics, what critics think of various things, um, you know, and sometimes it even gets 
a little bit, you know, inception, like you have critics criticizing other critics who are criticizing an original thing. And then you even have the author's opinion on that whole chain of events. Uh, and that would probably be a tougher passage, but they do kind of combine them in that way. All right, what's next? Oh, let's do this. Oh, there's two. Competing theories on a subject. So this is actually, I think, one of the most common ones. Uh, it's like, hey, here's a topic and here's multiple theories uh, that um, might help you understand uh, that original topic. And it might even weigh one theory versus another. And then this green one is very similar to the purple one, but slightly different. Tracking the author's opinion is a pretty important GRE skill. They like to ask about it a lot. Um, a common phrase of questions is, which of these would the author most likely agree with? That sort of thing. So knowing what the, what the author of the piece thinks is pretty big. Uh, and then one more. And in fact, this is the one that I pulled a couple examples of. So we're going to practice this one the most tonight. A change in perception. People used to think one thing. Now they think another thing. Uh, again, it could be um, any number of different topics. And that's my first little note here. Um, these archetypes can show up in any subject. You know, science, history, and arts, uh, I feel like are the, the big three for the GRE um, because they like to do something that's kind of academic feeling where, you know, you've read about this general topic before, or you've read something about science before, you've read something about history before, you've read something about arts and culture before, but it's very unlikely you've read this specific, you know, topic. Uh, and uh, I think that these, these archetypes can show up in any of those subjects. Uh, and one more thing, I mentioned like, hey, sometimes it's a critic commenting on a critic commenting on someone else. Yeah, a tougher passage will mix multiple of these together. Um, in fact, most passages are a mix of these things in somehow uh, or in some way. A lot of what we're going to do tonight is like um, going through each of these five types and saying, okay, when you see this type, what can you kind of expect? Uh, what's the structure of that passage going to be? But uh, some, some passages are going to follow that sort of strict structure that we're going to look at tonight for these five um, archetypes. A lot of passages, especially medium hard ones, they're going to start mixing these together, um, or it'll have a little bit of one type of archetype for the first half, but then switch into a different type in the second half. Um, so keep these five in your mind, because um, we're going to come back to, to each of them a little bit. But here's where I get into um, a couple little caveats before uh, we move forward. Um, and those are here on the left. So I don't want you to think these are official GRE terms. These five categories that I just um, mentioned to you, um, they are pulled from the official guide. Uh, you know, I, I was just going through this morning to see, you know, which passages in the official guide, the GRE's book might fit each of these archetypes. Um, a lot of them fit one of them, but the names I gave, you know, those aren't officially provided by the GRE. These aren't like things where, you know, you can officially categorize them. Uh, there will be some passages that are just different. You know, they're just not <laughs> one of these things. Um, if only it was so easy that all passages would be one of these five things. It's not quite. And just like we were talking about in movies and TV, not every single example is going to have every single quality or element um, of that archetype. Uh, the good news is that there's still a benefit to like thinking about things in this way, or at least like starting to notice, oh, you know what? I've seen this pattern of, of passage before. Um, because if you get to where you're familiar with the structures, that frees your brain up to really dig into the details of, uh, of the particular passage. Um, just like how watching you know, a baking show might be easier than watching um, a complicated drama where you don't know what's going on. Uh, and then like many tips on, uh, well, really the whole jury, but especially reading comprehension, I find um, the, the more dense and difficult the passage and the more unfamiliar the passage is to you, the more of these might help you out. Um, for me, you know, I've seen a ton of GRE passages and when I see a new passage, it's almost never happens that I have seen the topic before. 
you know, because they just pull from all over the whole wide world of academic content to make these passages. And um, so I'm not showing up and do a new passage saying, oh, yes, of course, it's the blah, blah, blah. But I am able to show up to a passage that I've never seen and say, oh, you know what I think they're doing? I think they're comparing two competing theories and I'm onto them. I know what types of um, patterns of information they do when they do that. So uh, one more thing before we get into actually talking about the, the five. Why is there so much about these critics commenting on each other, uh, you know, changes over time or competing theories? What, what's the deal with all that? Because I tell you what, whether it's a clean archetype or not, a huge percentage of Jiri passages are going to have something related to one of those things. Um, and I think the first reason is they're looking to see if you can track the big picture and the little, the little picture at the same time. We know the Jiri does this. Um, they love to see, can you hold on to the overall purpose of the passage? That's why they ask you about the overall purpose of the passage, but still understand, or at least uh, know how to go back and dig deeper into those little specific details, uh, like maybe the justifications that one person used. Uh, and then similarly, they like to tell, like they like to ask you like, what was an opinion and what was a fact? They won't literally ask you that, but a lot of multiple choice questions will come down to a couple answers that seem right, but one of them was like a more hard fact stated by the passage, and one of them was like just the opinion of a certain uh, side of whatever conflict is happening. And just more generally um, discerning two differing viewpoints. Uh, and so what what I think is they love to ask about these these types of things. Um, because of the fact that they're great places to bring up these big picture, little picture conflicts. They're great places to um, allow you to have to tangle through two different perspectives in the same passage, whether that's person A versus person B, old opinion versus new opinion, uh, or whatever it is. Um, these sort of uh, more conf conflict-based passages really let them do that. Uh, okay, so with most of our time tonight, we are going to uh, do this. We're going to make GRE reading comprehension into Mad Libs. Uh, what do I mean by that? So if you don't know what Mad Libs is, um, Mad Libs is, uh, you know, something that uh, at least I did a lot as a kid. It would come in this little book, and it would be something you just did for a laugh. And the, it would have these sentences with blanks in them, actually almost like GRE vocab sentences. It would be like, they went to the yeah, blank and they couldn't, you know, uh, blank because they were so blank. Um, and then you, you, all you know is that you're supposed to fill in, you know, a noun and a verb and an adjective. And so you ask someone and you say, what's a, what's a noun? And they, they say, I don't know, trash can. And then you say, what's a verb? And they say, swim. And then you say, what's an adjective? Uh, and you say, uh, silly. They went to the trash can and they couldn't swim because they were so silly. And then if you're a kid, this makes you laugh hysterically because the sentence doesn't really make sense. Um, so what I mean to say by turning GRE RC into Mad Libs is um, basically we're going to look at the structures of each of these common um, archetypes uh, and leave some blanks because we never know what the actual content is going to be. We just know the structure of information. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to mad libize each of those five archetypes I mentioned. Uh, again, there's there's probably other ar archetypes I didn't think of when coming up with this list for tonight, um, but these are some of the ones that I see the most commonly. And then at the end, uh, I picked one of the five and we're gonna look at one or two examples and then see how, how it actually plays out. Uh, let's get into it. And if you have any questions, y'all just uh, ping me in the chat uh, anytime. Okay, we're gonna start with probably the most basic one, which is just explanation of a concept. Uh, when I'm, and what I'm going to do here is um, lay out an approximate outline of what each of these is going to look like. In explanation of a concept, the first thing they're probably going to do is introduce the concept. 
So an example would be, you know, the first sentence uh, or two uh, will probably cue you in. What is the concept or phenomenon being explained? Um, whoop. I'm going to say probably sometimes tonight, but even when I don't say probably, just remember not every version of the archetype is exactly the same. So you can kind of insert your, your probabilities. Um, then they're going to probably explain uh, some sort of process. Like it might be, let me give an actual example this time. Like the first sentence would be, uh, the, here's a scientific topic name. <laughs> that's not their exact quote, but that's what the sentence is doing as a function. Uh, and then after that, they, they have to have something to fill up a paragraph or two. So they might say, uh, there are a few steps that allows blank to happen. And then they'll basically have a little bit of one, two, you know, three. They'll explain to you some, some steps in the process. Or if it's not a process, um, uh, might be some background info about like how it was discovered or something like that. Um, and then in this one, there there might in the end be some sort of conclusion that like tells you why it was being written. But for these ones, I find more than the other archetypes, it tends to kind of feel like it just started and ended. You know, you don't totally understand the topic yet. You don't know if the author was really trying to make any particular point other than um, introducing the concept. Um, and uh, one thing I want to talk about a little bit with each archetype is a spotlight on main idea questions, because that is a common uh, one of those common question types and i think it's one of those where the understanding the archetypes might help the most because what the archetype really is is what's the author trying to do why does this passage exist um and uh that's what these questions do as well main idea questions ask you what's the main point of this or why does this exist so look for words like uh like these if you think that it's uh, an archetype that's just kind of explaining something, look for explain, uh, look for discuss, oh, or even the word I use, introduce. Those are some verbs you might see. Evaluate, yeah, that's a good one. Nice, in the chat. Um, if it's evaluate, I will make one note that um, an evaluate would probably indicate that the author is giving some opinion, um, which could certainly happen in this archetype. It might be just a couple pa passages explaining something, and then at the end, the author says, the author chimes in with like an opinion of, of something uh, about this topic. Okay, so this one is probably the the, the least archetypal of the five for tonight, because it's kind of just, hey, they're explaining a topic. Not that much more to it. But things get, start getting a little more juicy. Competing theories on a subject. Uh, like I said, this one is super common. Uh, and you can probably predict what the Mad Libs for this one is going to be. This is where it starts to feel a little more Mad Libby. Group one thinks blank about blank. But group two thinks blank about blank with the Mad Libs note that this is a different opinion. Uh, let's make this small. There we go. There we go. Now we're really Mad Libsing. Uh, same topic. Uh, 
And this is an opinion and a topic. So that, that part's kind of the more obvious part about competing theories on a subject. There's probably every single one that I would categorize as competing theories on a subject has got to have these two things. What do y'all think are some other things that this archetype might do? Argument through each group's thoughts, yeah. Um, let's actually, here, I'll make some sort of follow-up notes in purple. Um, hey, that's orange. For either of these, might go into a little detail or a lot. Um, and actually, I think a better way of mad libizing, oh, a better way, a way of mad libizing um, what you just said there uh, in the chat is adding a third blank because blank. Uh, there's a reason why they think that. Group one thinks blank about blank because blank, opinion, topic, reason. Uh, and the same thing happens down here. So every single competing theories is probably gonna have that. Um, and then sometimes, now I'll do our, our add-ons, sometimes you'll have some other stuff too. Sometimes you might have this. And I, meaning the author, think blank about blank. Or you might have, and I, think blank about um, group one or two opinion. You know, so it might sometimes be, uh, you know, a certain opinion about the topic, or it might be a certain opinion about the uh, group one or two's opinion. Sometimes it might even be a simpler version. Uh, it might be, and I agree with blank because blank. Any of these might happen. Um, yeah, uh, critics support on one of the theories. You might have, and blank thinks blank about group one or two. Um, so this right there might be like a third party, not the author, not either of the groups, but like some sort of third party or critic. Um, let's see. Uh, you might also have and group one, two uh, is now going to win because blank. So this is actually where sometimes it starts to overlap with one of the ones we'll do later, which is a change in perception. Um, the jury likes passages where people used to think one thing, another thing, something else. So they might apply that to this archetype here, um, where there's a new piece of evidence and that's going to swing things in group one's favor or maybe in group two's favor. No surprise, the, these in my experience tend to be two paragraphs and they tend to be one paragraph mainly talking about one and then one paragraph mainly talking about the other and then maybe a conclusion sentence or two talking about one of these purple things um, down here. Uh, so if we think about our main idea questions, some words I think you're very likely to see um, on these main idea questions are things like compare. Uh, um, it could be discuss or explain if both theories are mentioned. Um, or sometimes, if the author comes down more extremely on one side or the other, it might be, um, uh, let's see, uh, settle or um, determine or that evaluate word again, um, the winner of a debate. Again, they're probably not going to use the word debate or the word, they're definitely not going to use the word winner, but they might use those verbs and then fill in the blanks about the different groups. And then you realize, oh yeah, 
this is one of those classics where they're competing theories. So there, what the author was really doing was uh, determining which side was right or settling the argument. Let's look at the next one. Uh, next one, we got a critic's opinion of a work. This is another, uh, another classic. This one will usually start with a little bit of background. Blank is a thing that people have opinions on. Yes, exactly. In the chat, nice. It's gonna start with a description of the work. Um, and I use the word work very vaguely, which is purposeful because I think this blank, you know, could be most commonly, it would be an artist or piece of art. And by art, it, I mean, it could include literature, it could include dance, it could include anything. Um, but it might be, um, might be a historical document. Uh, it might be even a scientific theory, you know, um, that just came out or something. It could really be anything that uh, someone might criticize. Um, and remember when I, when I use the word critic, I don't necessarily just mean like someone who has a negative opinion. Um, and be careful of that because critic on the jury doesn't necessarily mean negative opinions. Um, like if you're a movie critic, the critic just means you let you comment on the movies. Uh, it doesn't mean you always comment negatively. Um, just someone with opinions and, and usually expertise. You don't usually get to be called a critic unless you have a certain level of accomplishment in, in the field of criticizing this thing. Uh, let's keep our Mad Libs going though. After they say blank is a thing people have opinions on, blank uh, thinks blank about blank. What are those blanks? Well, we got our, our critic, whoever it is, has their opinion about the um, work or uh, creator of the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and once again, I kind of want to draw a box around that part because that right there, that's like your backbone. That's the stuff you're, you're always going to have uh, when you look at this archetype. Um, and then there might be some elaborations on that. Um, and you're going to notice a pattern in these elaborations. Really, all of this is just kind of variations on a theme. So some possible elaborations you might have. Um, once again, I should try to copy and paste this. Uh, and I think blank about blank, uh, where the first blank is uh, the opinion, and the second blank is the critic's opinion. Oh, I'm missing something. Uh, oh, move my box. Missing my because. They do tend to give the reasons. They're not just going to be like, and the, this person didn't like it. They're going to explain why they didn't like it for some reason. Uh, and then the author will add their own uh, thing for that reason as well, because blank. Uh, another possible. Can you hear me now? 
Tell me in the tell me in the chat. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. My headphones have this button that that makes me mute. Uh, thank you, thank you for telling me that. I literally would never have known. Uh, Might have talked for twenty more minutes. Um, yeah. So and we could go on and and I'm not going to belabor these elaborations because really most of the elaborations they match or they have a strong amount of overlap between the different archetypes. Um, it's this part up here that is distinct. Uh, and then spotlight on main idea questions. I want to go beyond the verbs because I'm noticing a lot of the verbs are more similar than I realized before I started writing them all out. But let's talk about full phrases. Um, here is where you might see something like um, uh, discuss critical reaction to um, or evaluate the reputation of blank, where the, the blank is um, the original uh, thing. You might even have um, show why the interpretation of blank is complex because blank. Um, sometimes the you know the answer choices might be just saying, "Hey, this passage showed why it's a complicated topic because we introduced this other opinion." And yeah, it might be criticizes blank. That would be a word that would definitely uh, it would definitely use. So the word criticizes as the verb would be even more likely to show up uh, in this next one, number four uh, out of our five. Oh, I don't want to clear all drawings here because our top is going to remain so similar. Uh, the author's opinion of a work. Uh, and really, it's the same backbone at the beginning, except instead of, oh, oops, not changing perception. Uh, instead of blank thinks blank about blank because blank, well, that's kind of tough to say. It's I, the author think blank about blank because blank. Uh, so lots and lots of GRE passages mix in the author's opinion. Um, so this this archetype is probably, if, if I'm criticizing myself, the one of these that is the most often just put on as an end point onto the other archetypes. Like they take one of the other ones and they just stamp the author's opinion on it a little bit as well. Um, but sometimes you'll see it by itself. Um, and uh, whether, you know, basically you could take um, this one, where is it? Uh, you might take this one. And basically, the, the jury, I keep saying they, you know, as if the jury is one, it's a group of people in a secret room, um, you know, concocting an evil test, which may be a kind of this, but um, the, the GRE officially uh, might uh, add this, um, uh, add this Mad Lib sentence on the end of any other uh, archetype to, uh, or I shouldn't say on the end, maybe into, wouldn't always necessarily be at the end of the passage, any other archetype to uh, make it a bit more complex, because it basically just gives you one more thing to track. Uh, and we've seen this when we've tried to name the elaborations on the other archetypes. So I, I'm not going to give a list of elaborations here, because I, again, I think this one tends to be an elaboration on other ones. But I do have some thoughts on things to watch out for as you evaluate the author's opinion. Um, watch for degree, or basically the severity of opinion. Um, do they like it? Or do they love it? Um, do they kind of believe it? 
believe it's the most likely. Mm. Most likely have a few options. Or are they like super confident, like they're all in? Um, especially, I think that one. Um, uh, that one there I just mentioned is like big in comparing competing theories. Because if the author gives any opinion on which theory is the best or which critic's opinion is the best, you want to know what that what the author thought, but you also want to know like, are they really gung ho on this, or are they just kind of mild? Like, yeah, it maybe this. Um, and uh, uh, look for which evidence um, the opinion references uh, as its reasons, uh, because. Jiri uh, likes to ask about author opinion. Uh, you want to not just understand what the opinion is, but you want to definitely understand why uh, when it's the author. So spotlight on main idea questions. This is really where um, phrases that indicate you know, author's preference um, or indicate uh, a winner might show up. Um, so, uh, this is where you really might have like evaluate, um, uh, I don't know. You don't usually see, see stronger words like declare, but if you ever were going to see it, it's probably an archetype with a strong emphasis on the author's opinion. Um, you know, determine because determine has a certain, like, um, you're trying to discover something, right? So that's author's opinion of a work. Uh, and these lists we're putting down here, by the way, they are far from exhaustive. They're kind of just the first few things that you that you might be likely to see. And trying to keep that in mind since I do think archetypes help us with main idea questions. All right, uh, just one more, but this is actually the one that we're gonna close out the night with by looking at one or two examples. Uh, of this type of passage, a change in perception. People used to think blank because blank. All of these blanks, or all of these because blanks, they're usually going to be there, but maybe not 100% of the time. Um, and this could be an opinion, but it could be. Uh, really more of a presumed fact. So for example, a really common one in this type um, is like, you know, a scientific theory that was debunked or any, any old theory that was, that was debunked. Uh, old reasons they thought that. Uh, but now, blank happened. Now people think blank. Yes, exactly in the chat, the trigger of the shift. They're gonna tell you what caused the shift and they're gonna tell you what's the result of the shift. The old version, what happened and what's the new version. Um, you know, so uh, event causing the shift, uh, new opinion. People used to think blank because blank, but now blank happened. Now people think blank. That's a classic story out in real life, right? Um, our, our opinions as individuals changes over our lifetimes and culture's opinion on all sorts of topics changes over time as new things happen. Um, so some possible um, elaborations here. I think this one might have some of the more unique ones that we haven't seen yet. Because um, you might not just see author's opinion here, you might see um, people who still think blank are reacting like blank. Um, so this would be a reference to the old opinion. You know, when there's a big change of opinion, there, you probably have some holdouts. People are still like, no, the sun does orbit the earth. 
you know. Um, uh, uh, and then this would be filling in with what they're doing. Um, you might have uh, the new version. Uh, the new fact opinion is blank because blank. Um, <laughs> what do I mean by that first blank? Because it's probably pretty unclear. Um, basically, like, um, is the new opinion like rock solid or is it uh, unclear? How long is going to like strong, weak, uh, sure? Is it strong or weak? Is it sure or unsure? Um, you know, is this, you know, are we here in the new world with this new version of things? Or is it just like a maybe? Is it a discovery of a maybe? Because sometimes we have that, right? You discover something and you say, oh, that might mean we have to change our old opinion of something. Like, well, maybe not. Maybe we'll undo, maybe we'll find new evidence that changes the experiment or something. Uh, so in this case, um, if you have a main idea question, um, just make sure you watch or look for answers that address, as you might think, a change over time. Um, that sounds really simple, but uh, I bet you when you see one of these and you have a main idea question, there's going to be a few answer choices that don't even address the fact that anything changed. They just talk about some other part of the passage. Um, but if you have an article that's all about this, uh, the main idea is about the change over time. Well, that is all five of our archetypes, like sort of summarized in this Mad Lib form. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left, so we're just going to look uh, probably at one uh, of these, um, these passages that actually uh, follows one of these archetypes. And I already told you all that um, it's going to be this last type. Um, a change in perception. Uh, so you know that. You don't have to worry about identifying it. But I want you all to take a few uh, minutes. Take three, four minutes. Uh, read this. Um, uh, it's about some archaeological fossil thing. So you probably haven't heard of this very specific topic. Read this and send me in the chat like a summary. What would be your one sentence summary of this story? Keep in mind um, the archetype that we have. So take a few minutes. If you're done, send me that summary. And I'm going to type up here the, the Mad Lib we did for this archetype again.
Okay. Uh, now this passage is kind of tough. Um, I'm just going to talk through sort of how I would think about this um, in general. Uh, and maybe if I wasn't thinking about the archetype and then some ways that the archetype would help me understand this passage and then make a couple final notes about um, how I hope you might be able to go out and use some of what um, I talked about tonight as you actually read uh, read some Jiri passages. So um, first off, if I just generally, <laughs> someone said, hey, what do you read a passage about? I would say like, it's about a fossil they discovered and some stuff they learned from it. You know, uh, And that is all true. And that is not unhelpful, right? Like, that's the topic. That is the topic of the um, essay. Uh, the fossil they discovered, if we wanted to get in uh, this, you know, extra detail is, you know, it has importance because it's, I guess, the earliest or probably meaning the oldest uh, child that's found in fossil form, kind of creepy. Um, and uh, it had a certain name. And you know they learned a couple different things. It sounds like, but uh, that there's another level of detail that we might be able to get from this. Really understanding what's the story, what changed. They buried it in this passage a little more than usual, figuring out what exactly changed. Did anybody see what perception changed? Can we find any particular opinions uh, that did change? because of this new fossil. It's kind of buried in there, but there's a couple. And the one that really makes my uh, spotlight turn on of like, ooh, this might be it. This might be it, is the word previously. Um, as soon as, as I read this, um, when I see giving rise to new theory, I start thinking about this archetype. And I start thinking, ooh, something is changing because of a new piece of information. Uh, and I want to figure out what was the old what was the old version and what's the new version? Because I know that might be something as they ask me about. Why did this fossil matter? What changed? How did it change? Uh, people's opinions. So I become really sensitive to words like previously, because that's telling me the old version of the opinions. So um, previously, a far a forensis was believed to have abandoned all arboreal habitats. Uh, but, or however, uh, they think the new the, the new evidence said they, that this type of creature. Uh, could swing on trees. This is some sort of pre, um, pre-human uh, human. So I'm going to write that down, uh, and I'm going to start filling in my my mad lib. People used to think this type of um, uh, species or this species. I keep getting intimidated by actually pronouncing this Australopithecus. Afarensis. People used to think this species um, had abandoned arboreal habitats. Um, you know, I don't use the word arboreal every day, but I know arbor means something about plants or trees. So I'm going to keep that in mind. Uh, but then they found this fossil, uh, this new fossil. Now they think the species uh, maybe still lived in tree uh, tree filled areas and could even swing on trees. Um, the fact that they could swing through trees, um, it, it's not like they, they don't hit you over the head with that piece of information in this passage. It's kind of just in the middle of, uh, of a paragraph, but it is actually the biggest change that happened in this field because of this event. Uh, and I found it from knowing that I should be per perceptive of what was what did people used to think, and then using the word previously to cue me in. 
to actually where, uh, where that information might be. Uh, now there is one other, you know, thing here tagged on at the end. There seems to be a different change as well. So maybe I need to amend my Mad Libs to have two things that change. People used to think this species had abandoned arboreal habitats. Mm, I can't really tell what the old version of the opinion is here in um, this purple part, because all they say is has dramatically affected concepts of the origin of speech. So um, this one, there's a little bit less detail. So I'm not completely sure what change in the perception of uh, human speech um, or the thoughts of the origin of speech, but that's okay. If there's not a lot of evidence for it, if they don't explain the old opinion and the new opinion, that's actually a good sign that um, it's, it's information that is perhaps a little less important for understanding the whole passage. Uh, that's about it for tonight. Um, this passage is a tough one, by the way, um, that I just um, hit y'all with, but I picked it because um, it's actually one where I felt when I was looking for passages to, um, to put here tonight, I was looking for one where I felt myself using my knowledge of the archetypes to my advantage. And this was actually one of them because this, this um, passage kind of just feels like an info dump, but really they are telling a story. They're telling a story of the old version of what we thought about this Australopithecus and the new version because of this fossil. Uh, so I use my knowledge of the archetype to find what was that old version and what is the new version, because then I've got my story. Uh, I hope this is, has been useful for y'all. Um, when you go out and read more GRE passages, you know, you don't need to be quizzing yourself every single time, what's the archetype, what's the archetype? But just knowing that these patterns repeat, um, I bet you will start noticing them when you start seeing all, all those passages about critics, changes over time, um, and conflicts between two competing theories, you're going to say, oh yeah, I've seen this type of thing before. Um, and you'll say, yeah, well, with that knowledge of the structure, I can uh, sort of better attack some tough passages. Uh, it's nine o'clock. So at least where I am uh, on the East Coast. So we're about done, but does anyone have any questions about um, this stuff in the chat? I'm happy to answer them, uh, whether it's about this passage and how I got where I got, or just in general about this whole idea. I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so thanks for coming tonight. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, this will be on YouTube, you know, within a week or two. And um, go check out the YouTube playlist if you haven't yet, because there's dozens of these and they all cover different topics. So thanks, everybody. Have a great Sunday night.